Today on Facing Life Head On. Cord blood stem cell transplantation is providing dramatic, life-saving results. Meet the physician who provides this treatment, as well as a very special family who benefits. The public debate on stem cell research raises concern about how scientists harvest stem cells. Collecting embryonic stem cells is viewed by many as unethical because it results in the death of the embryo. But there's another option, adult stem cells that come from the patient's own body or can even be found in umbilical cord blood. Research shows embryonic stem cells have not cured any diseases. On the other hand, cells from cord blood have resulted in more than 60 treatments for diseases like leukemia and sickle cell anemia. This week we met seven-year-old Gina Rugari, a living example of how cord blood stem cell treatment is helping children born with Crab A. This is a genetic disorder that almost always results in death before the age of two. Gina's life was saved through cord blood stem cell transplantation. But the Rigari family story began more than a decade earlier. And tell us where your story began with crabbing. Well, our second son, Nick, was born in 1986. Nick just didn't seem like he was a real good um, nursery didn't seem to be able to uh, his muscle his muscles around his mouth seemed very weak it seemed like when he did swallow there was a lot of choking and he was a very fussy baby and at a month old when we took him in to see the doctor he told me that I just had a fussy colicky baby and that I was a nervous mother and so um, at two months of age took him back to the doctor for his first set of immunizations. And the doctor still said, it's, it's just you. You know, you're, you're, you're the problem. And they gave him his immunizations. And Nick actually screamed for five days after that and had a fever of 103 to 104 for five days. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep couldn't go to the bathroom, and I'd report all this to the doctor on a daily basis, and they just said, oh, get a suppository. Oh, he'll be okay. Give him more Tylenol. After about five days, the fever went away and the screaming went away, and at three months, we took him back in, and he had not gained any weight. He, he was actually kind of losing weight. Baby Nick was admitted to the hospital for testing. Doctors said, we can't find anything, so he just has failure to thrive. So what does that mean? He can't live? What, what does that mean? So at three and a half months, Nick was admitted to the hospital for observations, where they wanted to observe me feeding him in a quiet environment with no lights on, no stimulation, nobody in the room. They wanted the nurses to try to feed him to see if it, in fact, was me or there might be something else going on. So they sent us home. We knew nothing more and told me, you put your three-year-old in another room, you take the phone off the hook, you put, close all your curtains in your house, you turn out all the lights in your house, and that's how you feed your baby. Because the goal is just to get food in him right now. At four months, I had no luck with that. They admitted him into the hospital and they put a feeding tube in him. Nick continued to decline after that. He was released from the hospital. He actually started developing seizures. He went blind. Um, his muscle tone increasingly got poorer and poorer. With little hope and no answers, the Rigaris moved to Florida to be close to family. Nick was taken to a local pediatrician for monitoring. She told me, I think he has this disease called Crab A. And I said, well, what makes you think you know what he has? And she said, because 
you rule out all the normal neurologic stuff and you come up with the rare. He was already in the final stages and um, you know, he, he would die from it you know, within a few months or you know, several months of time. Nick died just three days after his first birthday. Doctors told his parents the disease was so rare they'd never meet another family who'd experienced it. But when Anne became pregnant 13 years later, they were told they had a one in four chance of having another baby with Crab A. When Gina was born, we decided to test her to see if she in fact had the disease. Gina tested positive. Doctors quickly referred the family to Duke University. Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, who has pioneered the use of cord blood transplants in children with diseases like Crab A, took the call. She explained to me that she could save my daughter's life because she would in fact follow the same course that her brother had followed, which the disease would progress and she would die within a year. Um, and she felt that she had transplanted two other children and that there was a lot of hope in saving Gina's life and basically she asked us how fast could we get there. We left that day. When we return, Dr. Kurtzberg sets out to save little Gina. Seems like it's not enough. <laughs> There's no surgery um, and it's not itself a very aggressive procedure but all the things you need to do around it are very aggressive. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Each week we feature real people who deal with real life issues head on. Some of their experiences are uplifting, while others will break your heart. But in the end, the message is clear. Those who follow biblical principles on the issues of life are blessed. Become a partner with us in providing a positive, life-affirming message to help change the way the next generation values innocent human life. Please consider a generous gift to help offset the costs of producing this important quality programming. You can donate on our secure website at facinglife.tv or by calling the phone number on your screen during normal business hours. Together, we can make a real difference for life. Earlier, we met Anne Rugari. More than 20 years ago, Anne battled to save her one-year-old son from a disease that doctors knew little about. Years after Nick died, Anne gave birth to another baby with the same disease. She turned to Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg at Duke University for help. In a baby with Crab A disease, um, we know that um, over time they're going to have very extensive brain damage and it will lead to their death without treatment. But if you can diagnose a baby very early in life or even prenatally, um, like Gina, and Gina was diagnosed because her family had a history of Crab A and they had had another infected child, um, then you can um, do the testing right when the baby's born. Babies that test positive for Crab A can be cured. The procedure involves a transplant of stem cells found in cord blood. The babies have surgery to place what's called a central line which is a special kind of IV that goes into the chest and then into the heart. And that IV is used to give them um, all the medicine and transfusions and feeding and everything else that they need um, to get them through the transplant. And it becomes kind of a lifeline. Um, it's good for the babies because they don't get stuck, there's no needles, but they really, really depend on it because they don't eat very well and they can't take medicines by mouth. Um, after the line's placed, they're admitted to the hospital and they're given nine days of very, very high dose chemotherapy, which kills their bone marrow and lowers their immune system so their body won't reject the new cells. And then on the 10th day, the new cells are given like a, tra like a little transfusion in the blood. Um, it seems like it's not enough. <laughs> There's no surgery, um, and it's not itself a very aggressive procedure, but all the things you need to do around it are very aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, the cells go back in the blood, you can't find them after one or two minutes. We think, just based on progress, that um, it takes three to six months for enough cells to get to the brain to stop progression of the disease. So were you there with her through the whole process? Yeah, yes. Never left. I never left uh, the hospital room for three weeks. How did she take all that, the process? She did great. She probably did better than she mom. She did a lot eh? better than I did. Yeah. As a transplant goes, she had a pretty stable course and did quite well. 
Since cord blood doesn't have to be perfectly matched to be a successful source of stem cells, Dr. Kurtzberg says it's opening a world of possibilities. Now, what exactly is cord blood? Well, cord blood is the baby's blood left over in the placenta or the afterbirth after the baby's born. And while the baby's growing inside the mom, the baby needs extra, extra blood because the placenta cleans the blood, puts oxygen in the blood, essentially does all the jobs that the baby's organs do after the baby's born. And upon birth, half the blood that was in the baby is still left in the placenta and the baby doesn't need that blood any longer. But you can remove the blood from the placenta within a few minutes of birth, test it and freeze it, and it has stem cells that can be used for a transplant. So it's an ample source of uh, stem cells for future research and treatment. Yes, it's a very great source of stem cells. And you know, it used to be discarded, just thrown in the trash. So it can be safely collected without any risk to the baby or the mom. And it's not a controversial source of stem cells. Now, what's the difference between cord blood treatment and embryonic stem cell research? Well, cord blood cells um, are a more mature form of stem cells than embryonic cells. Um, and cord blood cells can be harvested or collected without any risk to the mother or the baby. Um, and um, in fact, they used to be discarded um, after birth. So they really are a way to recycle a cell um, that um, can be collected very, very safely. Embryonic cells, you know, have every cell has the potential to be any kind of cell, but they also don't regulate themselves very well. So sometimes they transform into cancer type cells or tumor producing cells. Um, cord blood cells, not every cell has the potential to be every kind of organ, but when they do change into another kind of cell, they seem to behave better and they don't seem to cause tumors. Do you think that this is the next big step in medicine as far as treatment goes? I think we've gotten to a point where the easy drugs have been discovered and it's going to be much more difficult to find effective drugs for some of the diseases that um, cause uh, degeneration of tissues and organs. Um, but cells have the ability to repair organs and to regenerate organs and I think we're in a very exciting time when that's where, what's going to be developed. When we come back, we check in on Gina. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world, and its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. This week we met Anne Rigari and her seven-year-old daughter Gina. Born with Crab A, a fatal genetic disease, Gina's cure came in the form of a cord blood stem cell transplant. Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg is a pioneer of the procedure. She and her team at Duke University have performed more of these transplants than any other medical team. For Gina's mom, who already lost one child to Crab A disease, stem cell research has become a personal issue. But Anne says not all stem cell research should be supported. Embryonic takes the life of an unborn child. Umbilical cord blood just takes the blood from a newborn baby's umbilical cord and is used to give somebody else life. So it doesn't take the life of anything. What would have been your response if they had offered you embryonic stem cell experimental treatment for Gina? I couldn't have accepted it. I don't feel that it's right to take another life to create a life. 
And as it is, even to this day, seven years later after Gina's transplant, there's nothing that's come out of embryonic stem cell research that has even remotely saved an organ in anyone's body, let alone a life. Anne hopes to get the word out about the success of umbilical cord blood research, success she sees every day. What Gina had done, she was only the third baby in the world to ever have this done to her. Gina is considered a research project, so we do go to Duke every year for a week and she goes through a battery of tests, both internally and developmentally, to see where she is, um, to see if anything is happening within her body. Actually, they find a lot of healing going on continuously. And um, we go there every year and, and get results from that and test it. What is Gina able to do today as a result of the process? Some of Gina's p testing prior to her having the actual transplant did show some progression of the disease at that time, and some of that progression affected some of the nerves in her legs. Gina is able to stand, but not independently. She is able to walk, but not independently. Gina also had some nerve damage in and around the muscles of her uh, face and mouth, so she doesn't speak clearly. Hi, Dad. Let's go up a little bit more. Dad. Okay. But Gina is totally cognitive, age-appropriate, attends regular mainstream first grade. She does all the work that the first graders do. She does have some weakness in her hands, so she doesn't write as well, but she can type on a computer. So she takes her spelling test, typing her words out every week. She reads. She's in the middle of the pack reading, just like the other kids read from regular books that all the first graders are doing. She's doing all the math work that they do. She's a typical girl. She wants to pick out her own clothes. She wants her hair a certain way. She's very independent. She doesn't want me going out to the bus to help load her out on the bus. She wants me to stay in the house and wave goodbye to her from the window. She doesn't want me coming out to the bus to greet her. She's very independent. She loves to swim.